Very good evening to you. Welcome to another News Make Live broadcast right here on DBS Television with me, Timothy Polion. We go up until 10 o'clock this evening, at which time we'll be playing you the clip that peaked, and you do not want to miss that. As usual, we have a very interesting program for you. On, on this occasion, we're focusing on a health issue. Whether the discussion we have had over the last few days has been considered to be healthy or unhealthy. Several years ago, when the St. Lucia government and the European Union were discussing plans to construct an ultra-modern health institution in St. Lucia that is renamed, that has been named, sorry, as the OKEU Hospital, to the tune of EC $167 million. Well, many of us, we were very happy that this would be done. But I imagine that we never envisaged the pitfalls and the challenges that would ensue. We've heard on this particular issue over the last um, few days from the island's prime minister and minister with responsibility for fi finance with regard to how the OKEU hospital will be financed, and there's a talk of privatization. We've also heard from Minister Guy Joseph, minister with responsibility for economic development, and during the course of this evening's Newsmaker Live, we'll be hearing from him. But for the substantive part of the program, my guest is Dr. Ernest Hilaire. As a matter of fact, the OKE hospital is located in New York constituency, as a result. You're also the SLP spokesman on commerce, investment, tourism, science, and innovation. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. What is the SLP's position on plans by the government to enter into this PPP um, arrangement to finance the operations of the um, O.N. King European Union Hospital? Well, Tim, even before I start, let me to express our appreciation for the role that women play in our lives as well as in our communities and certainly as a, a political a politician I represent women are very very important in sustaining political life in the various constituencies so let me extend to the women of St. Lucia and my constituent in particular a happy International Women's Day it is interesting how what you said, Tim, um, and, I, and I need to fully understand what is meant in terms of the PPP, whether the PPP, as announced, is intended to finance the hospital. And, and I'm not sure, because listening to the Prime Minister, listening to Nancy Charles, listening to Honorable Guy Joseph, they, there's so many, they, there are a lot of contradictions and conflicting views. I got the impression from listening to all three of them that they seem to be going into an arrangement with a private entity, like the Prime Minister said, Anansi Charles, first to run the radiology department, and then to move on, according to the Prime Minister, for, uh, to take control of a comprehensive management structure. Guy Joseph, <coughs> Honorable Guy Joseph also repeated it, Anansi Charles. They seem to be suggesting that they're going into a PPP for the management of the hospital and the Prime Minister actually made a point after they finish with the OKEU, the OKEU hospital, they will then go to the hospital in the south. But in all instances, they spoke of a management structure. So they need to be very clear and tell St. Lucians whether or not the PPP that they're talking about speaks of a, what you call a management and operations and maintenance contract because they're different forms of PPP from leasing the, the public asset to a private entity to run and to manage it, to joint venture, the different forms, uh, but you get the impression that the government is first engaging an entity to run the radiology department, and thereafter, the entire management of the hospital, and of course, the Prime Minister said later on to run the hospital in the South. And I think St. Lucia's need some details. If an un a understanding and an arrangement has been put into place, we need to be told exactly what it is. Honorable Guy Joseph went on to say that um, there will be a payment will be made to the entity to manage the hospital. And I think in his, his statements, he said so. Senators would certainly want to know um, how much they are being paid, first of all, to run the radiology department, and secondly, to, to manage the entire facility. And is it a technical assistance that's been offered on their part? Is it that they're going to advise St. Lucians to, to, to manage it? Is it that they are going to manage it entirely 
and being paid to manage it, which means they don't operate it for profit. Essentially, if, you, if you're just managing it on behalf of the government, they just pay your management fee, they pay your technical <coughs> people, they pay your thing. What is the scope of involvement of the, of, of the entity that has been engaged? And, and I think it is not enough to just say, first of all, they'll manage the radiology department and then they will um, manage the entire structure and then move to the south. We need to know exactly what's the scope of involvement and what's the cost of it. Um, are solutions going to be involved in the decision making? Um, because the Prime Minister again sent some conflicting signals. The Prime Minister announced, and, and he was wrong in what he said, that the Labour Party first decided to set up a private entity to manage it, and that they've agreed with that and they're going ahead with it. What the Labour Party did was to establish a statutory body that would manage hospitals, similar to what happens in St. Jude. Now, that's slightly different to a private entity coming in to manage the, 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 the hospital. Um, the, it, it was very clear from the, the act that was um, that, that is present for everyone to read. Mm -hmm. It is a setting up of a statutory body that would manage and run and operate the, the hospital. Um, so if we're moving away from that and we establish a PPP, the other point that's important to note, Tim, um, as far as I recall, and of course I'm sure the government ministers and officials can correct, Parliament did approve a, 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 a bill that dealt with how we should do PPPs in St. Lucia. There was a bill that clearly outlined the process, which included there must be competitive tendering. So we need to be a little careful. As far as I know, that, that was passed in the upper house and the lower house. I can't tell whether it was assented. But as far as I, I recall, there was a bill that was brought before Parliament and went through Parliament that clearly states how the government should go about doing PPPs. And I recall clearly a process was outlined, each section explaining how each stage should be embarked upon. And I noted they had to be competitive tendering. So if <coughs> the Charles is announcing that this is a PPP, I'm wondering whether it does fall under that legislation. But let's put that aside for now. Let's just focus on what has been said. Um, so I'm also hearing, and it's, a, it's another bizarre comment, and Guy, Honorable Guy Joseph said it, the Prime Minister said it, Nancy said it, that we cannot afford universal health care in St. Lucia. We cannot afford it. We're not going along that road. Now, we all know universal health care was a concept introduced by the St. Lucia Labour Party. It is basically universal health care, as far as I know, and as far as I know is internationally understood, means making sure that all your citizens receive health care. But you're saying that we cannot afford healthcare for everybody in St. Lucia. But at the same time, they say they want to make sure that every St. Lucian get healthcare. And the way they're going to do it is through universal healthcare insurance. Now, this is either confusing or it is political. And let me explain. It might be political for the simple fact that the government does not want to say they're implementing universal healthcare because it was a concept introduced by the Labour Party and aspiration introduced by the Labour Party. So to say we are now introducing universal health care will seem like they're doing a project that was announced at the time initially by the Labour Party. But to say instead what you're going to do is to introduce universal health care insurance, which really is a way of financing universal health care. So to say we cannot afford it, yet say we're going to do it, but we're going to do it for universal health care insurance. What you're really saying you're going to do, this is your, your methodology or your modality for financing universal health care. Because there are different ways in which you can finance universal health care. You can finance it through direct taxation by, say, you're going to increase the VAT from, well, now it's 12.5%, bring it up to 15%, and the money is used for that. You can do it through NIC contributions. Everybody who pays NIC would pay it, and government would pay for persons who don't pay NIC. Or you could do it for an insurance, which is, which seems to be the preferred option in this case. Now, you're giving an analysis of what has been said with regard to plans to finance the operations of the OKEU hospital. But what is the position of the opposition, St. Lucia Labour Party, in terms of how we should embark upon this particular um, process? Well, I, I think, that, first of all, the Labour Party is committed to universal health care. I think every government should be committed to universal health care. And I think the United Press Party, and all they say, even when they say we're not going down that road, what they're trying to do is universal health care. Make sure every citizen gets, gets health care. So first of all, we support universal health care. It was an aspiration 
Exactly. Secondly, we believe there are different models that have to be used to finance universal health care. As it is now, we agree that the monies in our budget and monies available in the consolidated fund cannot fund universal health care. So we agree to that, which is why there was not greater action in opening the hospital. And, because, right, and by extension, so, just cannot finance the operations of the OKE hospital. Well, the operations <coughs> and the provision of universal health care, mm -hmm. whether it is St. Jude's, whether it's Soufre, whether it's Denry, we cannot afford it, not just um, the OKE. But, but let, me, let me stop you there. You're saying that this is one of the main reasons why the hospital was not opened in the first place. Yeah, five months. Uh, right. Yeah. But that was not the impression we got uh, mm -hmm. just a, a few, a, a year or two before mm -hmm. the last general election. When, for example, you had the um, naming of the health institution mm -hmm. after Mr. Owen mm -hmm. King and the EU and so on, and the impression was given then that the hospital would be opened in a matter of months. Right. That was, no one said yeah, yeah, that they yeah, were facing yeah, yeah. financial problems right. then. No, no, no. I, I think it came from very early. There were always issues about how it was going to be financed and there were many technocrats and consultants working coming up with the right packages that can ensure that the hospital is financed there was an aspiration that the hospital would be open in months now you can open a hospital and the government has said so in fact the government is boasting now that they have started to phase in different services. There are many ways in which you can open it. You can open it with a full suite of services. You can open it with a basic suite of services. There are many different ways in terms of the scope that of services that you can provide. But you can open the hospital. You may not be able to offer oncology and maternity. You might keep it at VH. There are many different ways in which you can open it. The aspiration was to open the hospital. The reality is that it would cost, from all estimates, and I think Honorable Guy Joseph said, said so earlier today, between 60 to 70 million dollars just to operate the OKEU hospital. So coming back to the point <laughs> you made, how we go to approach it is for us to be able to have uh, different options and put it before the public, put it before stakeholders, nurses, doctors, um, employers and say to them this is option A, this is option B, this is option C and have some public dialogue and discussion on it. But Dr. Eli, don't you think we're putting the card before the horse? Or, or we did that several years ago when we were discussing the proposed um, plans to construct the health institution. It seems then... No, no, but that what, we, what was put out, it, I can't recall. It, it seems then that we are so eager yeah. um, to, to get this gift from yeah. the EU yeah. that we never um, engage in some forward thinking and right. to say, how are we going to finance this okay. beam off? Yeah, no, that's a good point. You, we know we need to have universal health care. We know that. We know our people of St. Lucia deserve better. And let me tell you, even before the Labour Party, you recall Romanas Lansico yeah. and his cry for a new hospital? Mm -hmm. You remember the song sung by Invader um, Victoria? That's how far back St. Lucians were crying out for a better healthcare system in St. Lucia. So it's a, an aspiration sh um, shared by St. Lucians across the political divide. So we know we need a new hospital. We know we need universal healthcare. The big issue would be how do we implement it? Having the facility at the OKEU and the other satellite facilities is the first stage. Now the second mm -hmm. stage is how do we populate it? How do we operate it? And how do how we deliver the services? And that's the stage we are at now. Yeah, no, but, we have the but, but, but don't think, don't you think then, and, and I mean, <laughs> inside this 2020, don't you think that definitely we should have discussed how are we going to finance this structure? Even before we build before the hospital? We I, I, I'm not necessarily agree no, with no, you. No, 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 but if you're constructing a home, Dr. Yeah, Taylor, yeah. and you and you're going to take into consideration how are you going to maintain that home? Now, Taylor, how will you pay the loan? That's a very good point. Into consideration. Now, if along the way you fail, Mm. then it's, it's understandable exactly. so i don't know i don't know that the governments uh -huh. took all those issues into consideration yeah. with regard to the financing of the o ok eu hospital yeah tim, okay because, are you in a position to yeah. tell me whether that was the case no tim what i'm saying to you is that you you put in place infrastructure and you discuss how you're going to finance its operations and there are a number of options you can consider and I, I don't necessarily agree with you about the house because people can build houses. They're not sure how they're going to paint it. They're not sure how they're going to buy the furniture inside. But one thing they know, they're going to start building their house. And God will, with God's grace, they will finish it. I think most so, people, so, what they do, so they build. No, no, most people, people, most people, and you know that, people build a small structure and they add on to it. Yeah. But That's okay, what most okay. people do. So, so let, mm -hmm. let, let's move on, though. Um, so, yes, we are at a stage now where we have to determine having the structure. What are the other elements of a universal healthcare system and how it's going to be financed? And the point is, there are options. 
There are options. Some may be unpopular, and, but there are options because you can raise through taxation to finance and make sure everybody gets health care in St. Lucia. But how much of a sacrifice will it be? Can we expect bipartisanship on this issue because you're saying that they will be controversial? Now, can will the St. Lucia Labour Party launch onto those issues where there is discontent among the St. Lucian public yeah. to say that the government has decided to take a bold decision on this yeah. particular matter. Let us support the government. Well, it depends on what, what the government decision is, because we believe and we support universal, universal health care. That's an uncompromising principle. In financing it, there are different options. And if the government comes to parliament and says, look, here are four options we are considering, and we put it to the people of St. Lucia, and as the opposition, it is our responsibility to... to, to, to hold the government to account, to ask them the difficult questions, and to protect the interests of, of, of the public. That's our role. And therefore, if the government comes and says, these are the four options, we will share our perspectives on the four options. We will engage in a critical assessment and a critical um, review of it and share our thoughts on it. And usually that happens in Parliament. But if the government decides there's going to be no consultation, or consultation is within very confined spaces, and therefore when a decision is made, and if you listen to Guy Joseph, He's saying, we're not yet at a stage where we have enough information to put out for consultation. But he then goes on to say, we already decided that government will pay the health insurance for the poor, the indigent, and the children. Now, you cannot on one hand say, we've not yet decided what we're doing. We don't have enough information to put out on the table yet for the public to respond to. But we've already decided government will pay for the poor, the indigent, and the children. And the people who pay NISC now will have to pay towards insurance, which means NIC will go up. We'll hear from Mr. Guy Joseph yeah. later in the broadcast. But do you think that there's just too much tardiness um, in finalizing plans for the setting up of a UHC? I know that several years ago, um, the effort started with um, the then head of the NIC, um, Ms. Emma Hippolyte, yeah. included um, the Dr. Stephen King. And somewhere along the way, the mm -hmm. Senate Labour Party lost the election. The United Workers Party came into office in 2006, did not continue. SLP spent came back in two years and did nothing. Right. The yeah. SLP came and spent five years. Yeah. It did it, anything? It, it, it did anything? Yeah, it did more than nothing. But it did nothing. <laughs> it did more than nothing. <laughs> it it, it yeah. has something to show? Yeah. Well, you, you think it has something to show between 2011 and 2016 as far as UHC is concerned? Well, I don't think we reach a definitive point, and, and I was going to come to that point as my final point. The he healthcare is a major issue confronting all societies, major. Look at what happened with Obama and Trump in the, in, the, in the UK with NHS. I mean, there's a raging battle in the UK about NHS, so much so that the Conservatives during the, the poll, whether to break from the EU, said when we leave the EU, all the monies we're going to withdraw from paying now, we'll use it to fund the NHS. That's how controversial healthcare is. So it's a major issue even for developed societies. And the reality is that when countries have to make the decisions as to how to finance universal health care, that's where it becomes a difficult decision. And financing universal health care, and I don't buy the UWP argument, the minister's argument, that there'll be no universal health care, they're not going down the road of universal health care because we cannot afford it. What they are trying to do is trying to have universal health care. The big issue is how it's going to be financed. And if they face the same reality that the Labour Party government face, how do you finance this thing? And, and that's a big challenge. And, and I think whether it is Labour Party, UWP, the financing of universal health care is a major, major issue to be confronted with. And, they, and that is what has plagued both the United Workers Party now, in the past, and the Labour Party when they were last in government. The point is we have to solve it once and for all. And the Senusha Labour Party is not opposed to being part of that national dialogue and offering its own suggestions, its own views on it, because we have to resolve that as a country. It's a long journey that has been started, and we need to complete the journey. Um, of course, we want more information. We need more information put out in the public domain, and maybe a debate in Parliament as to how it should be done. Of course, the practice in Parliament is when you offer advice and critical review, you just outvote it. But at least the people of Senegal would have heard you know, both sides speak about it. And, and, and if, trust me, if the, if the proposal is acceptable and the public feels it is something that can be worked with, we'll be part of that because 
whichever government is in power has to deal with the issue of universal health care. And persons like myself getting very old now, so mm -hmm. you know, I must be worried too about the health care that I will get. You're looking forward to being in government one day. <clears throat> and, so. And, and so that somebody can um, refer to you as minister this or minister that. But what about the culture of people getting to office and not being effective in terms of implementing those critical issues that are impacting the people? So when you talk about crime, everybody has an excuse for not being able to address that crime situation. When it comes to healthcare, the same obtains. What would make you different from any other politician if you get into government and for you to navigate through the red tape mm. and implement those critical issues that will touch the lives of the people of Saint Lucia? Yeah. But you know you're moving away from healthcare now and you're asking me, you know... Well, it has to do with healthcare yeah, yeah, in a way, in a, in, sense. in a sense. Because th yeah. that is what we're facing right now after several years of trying to implement yeah. UHC. But I, I, I think, Tim, one of the first things we have to do is something I try to practice during the campaign when I campaign, is to be realistic. Avoid making promises that even you yourself doubt you can develop, you can de um, deliver. It's the famous saying by, by Governor Cuomo of New York that mm -hmm. you campaign in, in poetry but you govern in prose. So in a sense, when you're campaigning, you see all the nice things, all the appealing things, all the emotional things to touch people's heart because you want them to support you and follow you, inspire them, you give them hope. And they follow you, five to stay alive and whatever else, and, and people believe in those things. And then the, rea the reality of government strikes you. That it's, it's not as simple as that. And you have to start backtracking and you start to realize government is about compromising and working with different stakeholders and getting consensus. And even some of the things you propose to do now has to be the product of consensus. And, you know, you start taking backtrack. So all, for me, personally, the starting point is to stay grounded, to say things you believe can be done, when I say to young people in Cicero, for example, I would want them to have a standard playing field size with lights, whatnot, because it's something I believe is achievable. And therefore, as you move now into government, is how to make the system more efficient. And, and that's a challenge for us as small you know, societies. When you're at university, you, you study government and government structures and public administration, and then you realize the difficulty in small island states to have high levels of implementation in the public sector for various reasons. The bureaucracy, um, the whole regulatory process, there are a number of reasons. And therefore, again, is, is how to be realistic and to set people's expectations um, you know, to the point where people do not believe that you had promised so much and now you cannot deliver it. But they tell that don't win elections. To win elections, you must make people dream big and believe things that they never believe is possible. And then they will follow you. I, I do not necessarily believe in that because I, I believe at the end of the day, um, you must probably under promise and over deliver. Uh, and that should be the guiding principle. Going forward, you think that as a nation, we need to discuss health related issues a little bit more? Yes, we should. We definitely should. And does that include politicians while they're on the hustings? Yes, we should. Mm -hmm. In a very frank and open way, we have to. I mean, the, the, the two or three issues, at, um, well, if you look at employment, crime or law and order, not so much crime, mm -hmm. law and order, um, and health. And of course, one can add education. That's probably the four of the biggest issues the society confronts. And we can't run away from it. You know, we have to talk about, you know, the healthcare of the citizen and how it's going to be provided and how it's going to be financed. We can that, that that train is at the station now and we need to be very clear what's the next stop and we have to decide it now. Um, so I, I, I believe we need to have that discussion and maybe in some ways the discussion that start that has been intensified now with the comments by the Prime Minister and the response by the leader of the opposition will evolve into a more mature dialogue and discussion. I do not agree with the government, with Nancy Charles or um, Honorable Guy Joseph, that there is not enough to put out in the public now to discuss. You don't throw out little snippets in the public and people start speculating and rumors start spreading and fears start developing because you're not giving people a more complete picture. It's probably better for you not to say anything than for you to fraud little stories. For example, I want to ask the Honorable Guy but, but, but if, if, for example, you're in the planning stages and documents have been leaked, mm. don't you think that that forces you to come out and say something? Then say the right things. Say the right things. But you might not be able to say anything that's definitive. Well, the Prime Minister said it, and the Honorable Guy Joseph said it, that God, they, they, are, they are thinking of universal health care insurance. That's where they go in. And that government will pay 
for the poor, the indigent, and the children, both the Prime Minister and Honorable Guy Julian said it, and people who pay NIC will pay for, for the, the health care through NIC, they'll make a contribution. Now, I need to ask questions I want to ask immediately, because if it's universal health care, it means everybody will be getting it. Those who pay NIC now will be asked to pay more, so it goes as their contribution towards it. What numbers are you thinking of? Is it also going to be the employer going to increase their contribution as well? When you say that the government is going to pay for the poor, the indigent, and children, who is the poor? So if you're not working, you're not paying NIC, you're unemployed, but you, technically you're not considered poor because you're a hustler. You do this, you break a job, you do this. Who's paying for you? Now, is government paying the entire contribution of the poor, the indigent, and children? Is it? Okay, from what they're saying, yes, they are. Those people that are in between, and you know a lot of them, I mm. mean, you, you hang out in the area, you know a lot of them, they don't, they, they don't pay NIC, they hustle, they make a living. In fact, most sanctions probably there, because from, from what I recall, we probably don't have more than 40, 45,000 people paying NIC. We have 175,000 people in St. Lucia. You understand? So those people in that middle, who's going to pay for them? And, and how, is it, how are they going to be covered? And, and already, just throwing out those questions out there, raises a lot of more questions. The, the, the announcement by the Prime Minister that is a management structure that is going to be operated by that foreign entity. What does that mean? Are we paying them? Is it technical advice? Are they taking over the whole system? If an agreement was signed on Tuesday, and I can be corrected if it was not signed um, on Tuesday, then it, tell us what's in that agreement. The Prime Minister also quite bizarrely, bizarrely said that nobody will lose their job. Nurses will be accommodated. Those who get jobs will be in the new structure, and the others will be retaining the old structure. Now, I'm not sure I understand that. Some who are chosen will be in the new entity, but others will be kept in the old structure, so nobody will displace, nobody will lose their job. What does that mean? Because surely, as, as for the nurses, that's good news, because the Prime Minister is saying, no nurse will lose their job. That's excellent. Yeah, but what's so bizarre about that? But which old structure he's talking about? Victoria Hospital. The, but if you have yeah. OKEO running, all the nurses, you, what do you say? But one day plans to operate both of them simultaneously at some level. Well, that's not the impression I got listening to Nancy Charles, because she said they're going to phase. E Victoria Hospital will continue to operate as mm -hmm. they phase mm -hmm. until they phase everything, and then she doesn't know what will happen to it. So Nancy Charles is saying she doesn't know what will happen to it, because they'll phase out everything to OKEU, and she can't say what will happen to it. But the Prime Minister is saying the nurses that are selected to go to OKEU will go, but all the others... But will are be you kept. saying, do you have a suspicion that some nurses will be fired? <clears throat> I saw a document circulated mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. everybody must resign, they must reapply, and those that are selected will be on contract. So you could, you could vouch for the veracity of that document? Well, I, 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 mm -hmm. I think there are times one can question documents, and there are times when... You know, if a document is circulated, there are such powerful implications for the jobs of nurses, and it is not true. It's a responsible thing to come out and say this document categorically is. is, is yeah, is, but is, if the government said that no one will be fired, is that responding to that document? Well, somebody must hold the nurses' association accountable for for saying that to their members, because I also nurses also told me that they were told that. So on the so, basis of a document. No, no, they attended the meeting. Yeah. There was and what, what were they discussing? The memo, the document? Yes, they were discussing mm -hmm. that among other things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know this is one who said to me, I've been a nurse for 25 years. I have another four or five years to go for retirement. Are they asking me to resign and then reapply? What if I don't get a job? What's going to happen to me? And, and, and Tim, these are valid concerns people have. Yeah, I mean, but if the Prime Minister says no one will lose their jobs. Right. Why but should no, he, he said that mm -hmm. yesterday? I think yesterday. yes, very categorically. So, so I, I, let me tell very you, categorically. I was very comforted. I right. messaged my friend and said, "Well, mm -hmm. your stress is gone." The prime minister mm -hmm. said, "Nobody will lose their job. Please save the tip, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. if tomorrow you're fired, you can see the prime minister had given the assurance you are not going to be fired." But the point I'm making is, explain to me how two hospitals will now operate, because if you are saying those who are selected will go to the new entity, and all the other nurses that are not chosen will be kept at VH then you're suggesting there'll be two hospitals running. So can somebody just explain? And that's the point I'm making. It's not so much whether the Prime Minister is sincere. You know what I feel about the sincerity of the Prime Minister already. So let's not go down that road. The point is, do, when you just put out snippets out there in public and you just see things, half stories, quarter stories, it, it causes more confusion. 
So the government probably can handle it differently. It's not my job to tell the government exactly how to handle the dissemination of information. But I don't think it helps. I think it creates more fear. It creates more suspicion. It allows for speculation and rumor mongering, which is not good for an issue as serious as the discussion on health. You're watching Newsmaker Live and my guest this evening, Dr. Ernest Ile, the MP for Castro South, also the SLP spokesman on commerce, investment, tourism, science, and innovation. When we come back, we'll be hearing from Economic Development Minister Guy Joseph. Stay with us. Welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us. You're watching Newsmaker Live right here on DBS Television. My guest this evening, Dr. Ernest Ile is the MP for Castries South, also SLP spokesman on commerce, investment, tourism, science, and innovation. Later, we'll be taking some calls from you, but uh, we'd like to inform our viewers as well that uh, you could check out the Newsmaker Live Facebook chat room. It's on fire. People are discussing this issue because it's very important because health care is something that we pay attention to occasionally, you know, not, not very often. But I think on this particular occasion right now, it is certainly the discussion is resonating with um, the people in particular, our viewers. So once again, Newsmaker Live Facebook chat room. You could visit and uh, participate in the discussion. And now, let's hear from the Economic Development Minister, Mr. Guy Joseph. He called my lunchtime program Newspin and RCI earlier today because we were also discussing the same matter involving the OKEU hospital and the proposed privatization. The reality of the situation is you cannot transfer VH to OKEU. We know the reality. There was a time that VH could not afford Panadol. You could not get a plaster. The beds did not have pillows on them or bed sheets. Have we forgotten those days? Is it a situation where all of a sudden we expect that there's an endless amount of money that you can run the new facility? From the assessments we got in, from all of the health experts who have been advising us on this matter, that it is going to take another, the health budget now is $110 million. You need another at least 60 to $70 million. That is to run the new hospital. Annually. Annually. Mm -hmm. That is not taking into consideration any free medical services to the public other than what is already available. And we still believe that this number is a very conservative number given the reality. So as a government, we've been exploring several options that are available. One of the things that the Prime Minister has been very clear on is that we cannot go into a new facility and the people of St. Lucia still do not have access to the health care. Because having the hospital is one thing. The affordability of it is something completely different. And that is why the approach of the government is that we are not looking at the universal health care. We are looking at health insurance for the entire population. Now, there's a difference between health care and uh, universal health care and health insurance. So part of the negotiations and the discussions that we are having, we were looking at giving, having everybody get at least $100,000 health coverage a year so that Anybody who goes to the hospital, the bills would be paid by the insurance company and not by the government or the individual. The mechanisms we are working on now is how do we finance part of that health insurance. Now, if you remove the burden of running the hospital on the government, it means that you can take half or three quarter of the health budget now and let it go towards the health insurance. And you can leave the balance to run the Ministry of Health and other health facilities because the insurance coverage is going to be for health across the board. We looked at the possibility of a coverage of a basket of services. 
But we felt that this was not maybe the best way to go. Because if your sickness fell within a, a certain category that was not covered under the basket of services, even if you are paying insurance, you would not be entitled to coverage. So we felt that a lump sum amount of coverage. So it means that if somebody has $100,000 coverage and after three months they've, they've used it, then it means that for the rest of the year they will have to pay for their health services. But the reality is that we need to do something because there's no way we can run the hospital under the present financial constraints faced by this country and the government. Now, we've been hearing from the callers that there isn't um, a consultation on this particular issue. Um, and I imagine that you all have been discussing all this whole, those plans behind closed doors. Um, is this with a view to, in, in the long run, consulting the people of, this, of, of St. Lucia or telling them this is the plan that we have in place, this is what we're going to implement? Tim, consultation takes place at different levels. I don't know that um, all of the consultations are at a stage where it can be brought into the public domain. What we said is that it is unfair to our people to be able to have to go to Matnik and Barbados to get services that are presently, you have the machines sitting at the hospital. So what we are saying is, the, for example, the radiology department, the same way that people are paying to go overseas to get radiology coverage. Can we not get somebody or qualified persons who can run that department for the time being? It is not because it's a partial opening of the hospital that we are looking at to make some services available. And gradually, as we develop the plan, and there is consultation, thing. there is consultation with, with health practitioners, with, with the Ministry of Health, with the various persons who interact at the different levels. I don't know that every decision the government needs to make, that it must come and discuss with the entire population. We, we are speaking to a number of agencies. For example, we have to engage the Chamber of Commerce to talk about the, the health coverage that we are looking for and the contributions that would be required from employers into getting everybody into a health insurance pool. But until you have some preliminary numbers that you can put on the table to say that, look, we can get this type of coverage, so we've been consulting with several insurance companies, for example. A number of them are submitting proposals to the government. Until you have these things concrete, what are you going to tell people? Because you cannot come to a consultation without having sufficient information. But while this is happening, do we keep the hospital closed indefinitely? Or do we begin to provide the services that can be provided that is not going to have a major impact on the operations of the entire hospital when that time comes around. Mr. Minister, the partial opening of the hospital, when is it scheduled to take place? Well, Tim, it's based on the availability of the expertise and, and the, for example, we've been, and, and a lot of the information has been out there, Tim. Every time we meet with a different group, the information is out there. So we've been speaking to Health City Cayman, um, about some possibilities. We've spoken to other groups that have come in and indicated. We've been speaking to Apollo Health and a number of other institutions. We have put all of that information out there so that people are aware that, look, at these are the different agencies that we are speaking to. We have been in consultation with the EU. We know that this was a grant from the EU, and you cannot make any decisions without their involvement. The EU sent in a consultant to work with the government to help in formulating a plan as to the best method to be used for getting the hospital operational. So everything we are doing is in consultation with the EU. 
the Bulgarian statement. They looked at it. They had their own proposals. So everything we have been doing, since, we are doing in consultation with the EU. They are fully aware of where the government is because we know that we cannot make a decision that is contrary to the approval of the EU because they are the ones who donated the hospital. So the discussion about the government is trying to take a gift that was given by the EU and want to put it into private hands. The interest of the EU is that the facility is used and that it is meeting the health needs of the people of St. Lucia for which they build the hospital. Now, Mr. Minister, had we instituted universal health care as we planned several years ago, do you think we'll still be in a dilemma right now? Whether See, it's whether it's it, the previous Central Labour Party afford, administration or the UWP. Tim, we cannot afford universal health care. We, we cannot even afford a basic health insurance. You think it's universal health care? You, you, you see what this is doing in the U.S.? You, you saw what... what President Trump just did with Obamacare. And, and these things are not even universal health care. You see, we, we try to make people believe that we can give them what we cannot give them. And when you come out and you speak the truth and you tell people, look here, what is being promised there is not realistic. They figure out you are the bluffer. You are the one who don't want to do things for them. But the reality is universal health care. Where are we going to raise the money? Who is going to pay for universal health care? If the government cannot run St. Jude and Victoria Hospital and the few health centers we have around the island, the very basic of health care is what is given there. It cannot be run effectively. You really think that in the present structure that we have, that we can afford universal health care? Anybody who would tell me that, I know that's not reality. And that is why we spoke about affordable quality health care. And that, that is the promise, the manifesto of the United Workers Party, that we are going to deal with affordable quality health care. And we still cannot cover every single aspect of health. That is why we are coming up with a formula that is kind of middle of the road. It is not too low. Neither will it cover everybody at every level past 100,000. So, so at the end of the day, I can tell you, I've been very involved in part of the negotiations on getting the health insurance. Even going to a private doctor, a certain number of visits will be covered for the year, a certain number of, of visits to a specialist, and a number of things are being put into the package. But it is not something that we are convinced that the government in and of itself would have the capacity to implement, given, because we cannot pretend that anything that is under the, the control of government runs into financial problems within a very short period of time. How is St. Jude operating now, um, Tim? St. Jude is operated with a subvention from government. And what we are looking to do now is with the OKEU, whoever is going to be running this hospital, we may have to put in a subvention, we have agreed that we would have to pay the health insurance for the poor, the indigent, the, those who are retired, the children. So all those who are not employed and cannot meet the health insurance needs, the government will have to foot that bill for everybody so that the structures must be in place and you must have a very efficient operation of that hospital to make it viable and to be able to keep it providing the service at the level and the quality for which it is designed. My final question to you, sir, is on St. Jude. What is the latest with regard to plans to reconstruct or whatever moves that the government plan to undertake? 
We are at a very advanced stage with our design for the hospital. We have reviewed all of the all of our um, as build drawings were completed, submitted to engineers in and out of St. Lucia. They have come back with some preliminary design um, of, of the new facility that we are looking at because I can tell you clearly the government is more bent towards just building a new facility. It may be adjacent to the existing facility or it may be closer to the brewery um, but in one of these areas, very close to the existing St. Jude, is we are settling on building a new facility that can incorporate some of the facilities of the existing um, buildings that are there. Final comments from you, sir? Well, I just want to assure St. Lucians that we are aware of the situation and we have no intentions of bluffing the people of St. Lucia when it comes to health care. We will tell them the truth and we will roll out a plan that will benefit the entire population. Not those who can afford and leaving those who cannot afford behind. It is a health plan that is holistic, that is going to take into consideration the entire population from those who can afford to those who cannot afford. Economic Development Minister, Mr. Guy Jovis, speaking with me earlier on today. That's during the RCI program, New Spin. What do you do some of the comments made by the minister? Well, I, I think, Tim, listening to the minister second time, I'm even more confused. More confused. Because the minister keeps saying, we are not providing universal health care. And I really wish somebody, and maybe some technical person, can call and explain why would the objective not be to provide universal health care. Because he keeps saying it over and over, we are not providing universal health care. What we promise in our manifest when we deliver is affordable quality health care. But the last sentence he said in his clip was that we will make it available, well, we'll provide it for the entire population. So I'm really confused. Is it that they're not providing universal health care, which I take to mean in its most simplistic way, to ensure that all the citizens of the country receive health care. So they say they're not providing that. They make reference, he makes reference to universal health insurance. Right. And like I said to you, I saw universal health insurance as the financing mechanism for universal health care. So he is saying that they will set up a universal health insurance. And he said government will pay for the poor, the indigent, and children. What happens to the rest? Because based on statistics from the statistics department, there are about eight, just over 80,000 active population, working population in St. Lucia. NIC has about 55,000 contributors. So there are about 25,000 people who are not paying NIC. They're probably in the informal sector. The Prime Minister announced yesterday that persons who pay NIC will make their contribution towards the, the health insurance. So that means if you pay an IC, you'll be asked to make a contribution towards it. That 25,000, who pays for them? Because in the informal sector, they are spending a little bit. Who pays for them? So is it right, therefore, when he says they're not providing universal health care to say, we're not providing it for everybody. There are people in St. Lucia, according to him, he repeated it over and over. Nancy Charles said it also. We are not going to provide universal health care. We cannot afford it. So explain. But he did say that the poor, the indigent, people are not employed and so on, they will be, the government right. will be putting the bill on their behalf. On their behalf. So, what happened to those who are not paying NIC in the informal sector, and they're not considered poor, and they're not children? Who provides for them? Persons like the police, for example, that get free health care, who will provide for them? I assume, I, I, I don't know. Uh, would they now be asked, will the police now be asked to pay health insurance because they, they're employed, they're not poor? They're not indigent and they're not children. So people that already received, by virtue of their profession, free health care, what happens to them? So I'm even more confused. And that's the challenge. We, we're putting out little snippets of information and, and not putting out something for the public to read and digest and to be able to comment on it. It makes it even more confusing. And, and I, I, I believe that the, the minister needs to give us a full story. And again, he says it. The persons who will be managing the hospital, and they, they are privatizing 
the management of the hospital. It has been privatized. I mean, it, it makes no sense to say it is not privatization, it is PPP. It is a PPP in a sense, but it has been privatized. So the management has been privatized. And you see, government will have to make a subvention. Again, team. So government makes a subvention, and the minister says the health budget is about 110 million. Half of three quarter of that budget will be used to pay the health insurance. So three quarter of 110 is about 81 million. Half of that is about 40 million. So about 40 million will be used to pay for the health insurance. I mean, he said those figures. And then he also said later on that government will make a subvention towards the people who are managing the hospital. What exactly is it? Is it the health insurance that will be financing the operations and the delivery of the, the health of the OKEU and St. Jude? How is it going to work? So are you making a subvention as well as paying insurance for all poor indigent and children? For me, there's still too many gray areas, and that's what public discussion is about. You need to be able to put out all the information out there for the public to consume it and for people to feedback. There'll be people who will be against option A. They, they like option C. Those who want a hybrid of A and a hybrid of C. Um, there are many different models that can be used to finance it. One thing I'm sure is a difficult decision either way. Whatever you choose, it, it will be difficult. But we need to have the public discussion on it. And the, the minister cannot be right to suggest you know, whether or not government should consult the people on everything they, they do. Almost suggesting that once you elect a government, then they should just do whatever they want. And I, he may, may not exactly state it that way, but that's the implication. And I, I think essentially is about the government being very open and transparent. If you did a PPP, was there any tendering? Under what conditions? What are the requirements? We just need to know who will be running the hospital. Is it foreigners? Is it locals? Who will be the nurses? Who will be the doctors? If you already sign an agreement with an entity, can there be a little more disclosure? Because this is a very sensitive issue, and people are talking about it quite a lot. People are desirous of healthcare, and everybody wants healthcare. Because you can say what you want until it hits you. <laughs> you know, you, you don't take it seriously. So I want to know, you want to know, the average man on the street wants to know. And, and, and I think it would help everybody's cause if they, the government just takes a step backward and then able to put forward more information in the public domain and let's have a national dialogue on it. Because we have to resolve it and all of us should be on board. Because I want to remind you, Tim, Dr. Anthony had actually set up a committee for on health financing and he had asked um, Honorable Stevenson King, who had been a former minister, to chair the committee. And of course, the opposition then did not cooperate because even as far back as then, Dr. Anthony realized how difficult that issue is and he tried to get bipartisanship in deciding how we're going to make those decisions. And he asked Honorable Stevenson King to chair the committee and he was, I don't think he was allowed to chair it or, or, or whatever. Because these are difficult decisions and we need bipartisanship in deciding how we move forward on this issue. You're watching News Make Alive. We'll take a break when we come back. Your calls. Do not forget also the discussion is taking place on our, our Facebook page, News Make Alive Facebook page. Stay with us. Welcome back. And once again, please log on to the News Make Alive Facebook page to participate in the discussion. And you can call right now. I'll put a telephone number on screen so that you can call with your questions and comments for my guest. He is Dr. Ernest Dillet, MP for Castry South. We have a call in line. Hello and good evening to you. You are on the air. Ready for contribution, caller? Good evening, my brother from another mother. Good evening to you, caller. Hi, hey, sir. Hey, then, honorable. Can I call you the next minister of uh, information? Mm -hmm. Caller, go ahead. Make your quick, your quick contribution. Yeah, very quick. I know you. You, you can't be tormenting me on your spin. No. Plus on this maker. To me, to me, to me. You, ahead. you don't want to be a terrorist for me, you know. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> make a point. You know, I, I, I want to say this, that they, they, we, we have two parties in St. Lucia right now. Okay? We have the St. Lucia Labour Party and the St. Lucia Labour United Workers Party. And I say this to me because what has happened is that... Okay. okay. Hold, hold on there, hold on there. Yeah. What is the question you have for Dr. Ile? Because we have a lot of callers online. So hold okay. on. Okay, so you don't mean to continue my point? No, okay. no. Okay. Leave, leave that for me, tomorrow. Let me, me, me ask my question quickly. Yes, go ahead. On that, Mr. Ile, why is it that the Labour Party is so weak? They cannot remove a, a, a Prime Minister who is basically a rogue Prime Minister because he doesn't follow the law. He can't appoint a Deputy Speaker. He takes 18 months to appoint a, a council to Integrity Council. He, he doesn't want to give the, the people who deserve the money, the National Trust, the work. And he can get money for OJ Labs, and he can't get money to pay the police. 
you cannot open the, the hospital because it's, you see there's no money, but you can get money for, for Ernst and Young. Why is it that the Labour Party is so weak they can't even move a rogue Prime Minister? Thank you. Thank you so much for calling. Well, I wanted the caller to remain so I can explain to him and ask him basically how does he want the Labour Party to remove the Prime Minister? Um, should we do what? I mean, to, I think there are certain options available to us. The Labour Party has been very... Um, you know, diligent in ensuring that we ask the government to be accountable for their actions, so to demand greater transparency and accountability from the government and to put pressure on the government. Um, if we have been asked now to step outside the constitutional boundaries and do whatever is necessary and at all costs to get rid of the, the government, um, if he's advocating that, then I respectfully um, note his, his point of view. You have a call. Sorry. This is News Make Alive Red, please. Hello, good night. Hi, good night to you, caller. Um, question for you, Mr. Tim. Earlier, you mentioned that the Prime Minister said no one is going home referring to nurses. My question is, since when you can't trust the word of the Prime Minister, I mean, day in, day out, there are inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, I'm a reporter, so I'm just reporting, relaying the information in case people did not hear what the Prime Minister said and did not watch the news. I'm just repeating what he said and reporting on it, merely doing that. Let's take another call. Once again, this is News Make Alive right here on DBS Television. Producer, do we have another call online? Think we have another call? No, we have lost that call. But continue to call the broadcast. And once again, please join the discussion taking place on our Facebook page, Newsmaker Live Facebook page. Once again, we have another call. Good evening. Hello. Okay. Okay, we have lost that call. Um, but definitely, what is the way forward on this particular issue? Because you're calling for consultation. Now, who is to say that the consultation will not be politicized? But we have a call. Hello, good evening. You're on the air. Hello, good evening. Hi, good evening to you, caller. Yes, this is Alvina Reynolds calling. I want to say good evening to you, Tim, and good evening to Dr. Renee Lay. Good evening, Tim. Yes, I am calling not with a question per se, but to make a, a few comments and uh, maybe correction in some areas, um, especially as it pertains to the uh, information um, disseminated by Minister Guy Joseph. In fact, I want to start off uh, my comment by saying that in the new hospital, before we left office, some direct awards were given, and that is one for cafeteria, laundry, kitchen, and car park. I want to know what has happened to the contracts for the laundry and the kitchen, um, because as far as we know, the cafeteria is almost complete, and so is the car park. What has happened there? Then I'm, I'm a very concerned when I'm hearing um, of the, the PP, PPP um, going to happen with the hospital. If someone is being contracted to manage a facility, um, I'm looking at it as a business. And so somebody has to get paid for doing that, as opposed to the structure that we had in place already, a human resource structure, looking at the entire complex, a director for each of these facilities and an overall person who will manage the other directors and done. There was a structure in the making for the management and running of the facility, all three facilities within the complex. What happens if you bring someone to manage the hospital? What happens to the whole structure, the way it is run, the way it is managed as a, as a medical complex, which is that was the plan initially by the Central Labour Party government. The plan was to have to transfer or transform DH into an urban polyclinic. You know what is happening with the health center on Chaussee Road, with the violence that was happening in that area. There was need for a polyclinic in the VH space. So there was plan to move the entire hospital into OK. EU space. We brought in a director of hospitals, one of the top directors from France. The EU gave us this person to come down as a gift to support us because transitioning to a new facility can be a very, very critical and people can die. And so this is why we got someone to come down to work with the team, the permissioning team, including 
Dr. King and the doctors and nurses, the head of nursing, head of medical department, etc. To make sure this was planned to a T, how many ambulances would be needed, and what day we had DJ down to a T. And now you're hearing all kinds of things changing around the place. Why is it so difficult for the present government to continue with the commissioning team, to use the services of the person who were exposed to the training and the discussion and the planning? What is that everything has to change and we're looking like we're going in reverse? And then I want to... Well, but be, before I continue, can I ask you a question, um, Ms. Reynolds? Yeah. Um, you, you're talking about the management team. That would, um, that would have um, come under the Millennium Heights Medical Complex, I Complex. think, right? Yeah. Um, how would that be financed then? It does not address it, right? You could have a management team put together, but how will you finance the operations? As we now have it, Timothy, we have a head at the turning point facility. We have a head at the mental wellness center, and there was going to be a director or head at the hospital. And then you'd find somebody, recruit somebody, who would be able to manage those three directors. That was what it was. That was what the plan, okay? And we're looking, we started looking inward, looking at St. Lucia, to look at persons who have the capacity, and maybe St. Lucians who may be out there in the region, and internationally, you have had that exposure to bring them in to manage. Because it was the we were looking at St. Lucian managing the facility. But, but, but ma'am, we're not, we're, not, we're not addressing how you finance the operations of the, of the medical but, facility, but financing its operations. There are persons in the position, and they are being paid. Maintenance work and so on? The persons mm -hmm. right now heading those facilities, the mental wellness center has a head. The pers there's somebody running the mental wellness center at the turning point. There are persons in those positions already. It was that we organized a structure. Yes, it may mean that persons may have to move up the system maybe from a grade 15 to a grade 16. But that is what it was. And uh, we were working very closely with the Ministry of Finance. The Prime Minister would sit with the persons representing finance from the Ministry of Health and other departments to see how this was going to be done. That was the structure that was being discussed already with Prime Minister Dr. Kenny Anthony. Okay, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah, Mr. yeah quickly. Go ahead. Mr. Uh, I heard about UHC. That plan, there was a proposition on the table. We brought in, when we came into office, it was dead. We resurrected UHC. We brought in economists, we brought in consultants, a professor who had looked at UHC in different countries and how it had worked, and they gave us examples that we in St. Lucia could look at. We spent months looking at it. We spoke to St. Lucia about what the basic basket of services would look like. And when we were ready, would come to them and tell them how much it would cost, how it would pay, how it would be paid. But this, I am not hearing about this right now. There is a proposal with several options. There is something, a document there, I am not hearing about it. And finally, we have no money, so we cannot afford UHC. We cannot afford to run a new hospital. We have to recruit people. But we, can, we have money to break down St. Jude, and build a new hospital? Why? Why are we going to do something as mad as this? If we can't afford to give St. the basic basket of services, healthcare services, we want to top them up to 100,000 per person, 170,000 person in, persons in the country, 100,000 per person. All of this now is we cannot afford UHC. We cannot afford to, to manage the hospital is costly, but we, want, we, we can afford to break down or to reject <clears throat> a facility that's already up almost 70% complete, and then you're going to build a brand new one on a, on a new property that you have to procure. I mean, something is amiss, something is quite off. And I think the Minister for Health, the Minister for Economic Planning, and the Prime Minister need to come clean and tell St. Lucian what exactly
exactly is going on? Do they even have a plan or do they even understand what is going on there? Okay, and thanks a lot. We just heard there from former health minister in the previous Senate Labour Party administration, Ms. Alvina Reynolds. We continue to take your calls. Once again, you're watching Newsmaker Life. We conclude at 10 o'clock this evening with the clip that peaked and my guest, Dr. Ernest Dile, MP for Castries South. Good evening. You're on the air. Bonsoir, bonsoir, bonsoir. Good evening. Hi, good evening to you, sir. Um, um, good evening, Dr. Hilaire and Timothy. Yeah, good evening to you, Connor. I think one of the the, 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 the loopholes I see in the, in the um, Labour Party is that, um, and I've said it before, I don't know if it's laziness, incompetence, or they expect to get into power by spontaneous combustion. It doesn't happen that way. It's hard work, my dear friends. You have to produce an alternative narrative. Get your technocrats in. There's DSH. Where are the maps and the, the, the definitions and saying why you think DSH is bad for us? Yes, we, we believe so. But we need maps. We need diagrams. We need to be educated, pedagogical. We have to, I'm, I'm monitoring this thing very closely. For example, I've given the DSH, where the maps is articulating the Labour Party's opposition and position. Also for this, this also um, hospital, it's not good enough to talk. Yes, talk is good, but use your technocrats, use your machinery to articulate visual aids so that people could see what you are fellows talking about. There should be billboards all over the island saying with, with maps saying what we think, yes, how the development in Vford should go. Uh, an alternative narrative until your fellows get to work. Virgil. Thank you so much. What say you to this? I mean, <laughs> um, I respect the, the, the caller. I mean, I know who is calling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I guess the same argument will apply to the Dolphin Park. Mm -hmm. Maybe the National Trust should put up maps and, and, mm -hmm. and billboards the same way. And other, other aspect, um, I think we've done a lot on DSH in explaining to St. Lucian's about the deficiency and the, 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 the issues we have with the DSH. We've been well ventilated. Um, I think the, a lot of, you know, discussion that has taken place and solutions generally, I think, have expressed their, you know, their disapproval of the DSH. Um, so I, I think there are issues, but I think the caller is probably making a broader point. The need for new forms of communication, new forms of education um, to get the people. To, one thing that's very clear to me, Tim. Mm -hmm. Quickly, because we have a caller yeah, there. Between the, that last caller and the first caller, both of them expressing the deep disapproval of the government and how they operate and which we're calling on the Labour Party to, to, to say in St. Lucia really. I mean, I think it's a reflection of the deep um, feeling in the country and dissatisfaction with the government. From just two calls? Else. Well, I mean, put that in a night when you've had four calls, if two say that, then that's 50% already. <laughs> this is a call. Good evening. Newsmaker Live, you're on the air? Good evening, Tim. Hi, good evening to you, caller. Uh, good evening, Tim. Hi, good evening. Tim, um, um, I want to ask Dr. Hiller. Dr. Hile, yeah, is not that the Labour Party that was in power a couple of years ago that failed miserably with um, Alvina Reynolds as Minister of Health? Um, who, the Labour Party, after one year that the same dude got done, was advocating that open St. Jude and give the people the stadium and you guys stay there for five years, or let's say four and a half, or whatever you want to call it, and you all could not um, complete St. Jude. You all could not open the EU hospital. Okay? Um, Dr. Hiller, another thing again. Um, your Prime Minister, Dr. Anthony, represents Vufort for 15 years as Prime Minister. Tell me of one development Dr. Anthony created in Viewport that the people in the South could have worked and do not come and cross countries 
Because you know the people down there, they do not want to come and live in Castries. They do not come and want to come and take a residence in Castries or up north. But the fact is, there is nothing, okay? There is nothing down on that side that these people can earn a living. So therefore, they have to come up to Castries. I, I agree that John Campbell fell miserably in Miku and the South. But Dr. Anthony, tell me what did he do to create jobs for Sufre, for Labry, for Schozel, for Viewfort? If you can give me one project that Dr. Anthony created to, for employment, I will applaud you. And, and let me tell you um, one thing again. I believe that Alan Shafni means well when he tells you he's going to build a hotel in Labry, a hotel in um, Chauvel, um, the DSS, because you know what happened? Alan Shasta realized Kenny Anthony and his government has failed and neglect the people in the South so badly. So you know what he's doing now? He's trying to create jobs that the people down South can work. And you're talking about the health care? Dr. Hille, when your government was in power, not even Panadol, people could have get from VH. And when you go to VH, um, they would have given you a prescription to go in the drugstore and buy medication because there was nothing. VH was in a mess. Alvina Reynolds fell miserably. And now um, Alvina Reynolds is calling and trying to criticize the government. You trying to criticize. Dr. Ella, let me tell you something. You know why you all can criticize the government? Because that government is doing so well. Okay? That government is doing so well that you all can come every day and get an issue about the government. That is what it is. Okay. That Thank you so much for calling, sir. Yeah. We'll have to end it there. Yeah. Go ahead. Now, Tim, I mean, okay, it's, it's very obvious the caller, but listen to what the caller says. Let, let's take it step by step. He said John Compton failed the South and Miku. He said Kenny Anthony failed the South and did nothing. But Alan Shasta is a success for the South. Listen to that. John Compton failed the South. Kenny Anthony failed the South. But Alan Chastney is a success for the South. He says, what project has Kenny Anthony done? None. But he's a failure. Alan Chastney is a success. Tell me one project Alan Chastney has done in the South to make him a success. Tell me one. He says Alan Chastney, but by the way, Alan Chastney stopped the administrative center. And he stopped many projects in the South, which the Labour Party started. But here what he's saying that Alan Chastney is planning to do well that makes him a success. The hotel in Black Bay, the hotel in in, in Shabusha in Sruzel. But when were those hotels signed for? Under the Labour Party. Both hotels were signed under the Labour Party and it's been two years of the United Workers Party. None of the hotels have started. They were both signed under the Labour Party prior to June 2016. So the Kenny Anthony said who has done nothing. And Alan Shastney is a success for the South. And he claiming what a success is, the hotel in Larry, the whole in, in Sruzel, both signed on the Labour Party and the Kenyan today. And his third evidence of success is DSH. We started negotiating DSH, but we didn't sign it. Because it's a bad deal the guy wanted. And this government signed it. Desecrating St. Lucia, giving up. A, and I mean, I can go into all the, and make this a discussion on DSH. Then he goes on to say, the length of time the Labour Party was in power, we did not finish the hospital in St. Jude. Tim, if you just do a, a little calculation, a little calculation, the project started in 2009, the government changed in 2011, just about two, two years, just over two years. This government has been in power almost two years, so that's about four and a half years. Labour Party was in power for five years with St. Jude. Now to say we were in power for so long and we never finished it, both parties have to carry and provide some explanations as to why the hospital was not finished. And I think the Labour Party has tried to explain why it was not, it was primarily a financing issue, a project management issue, and a lot of discussions that have taken place on that. But to suggest that, you know, the Labour Party failed miserably and the Europe is such a success, it's been two years and said you cannot finish. More so, the United States Party promised solutions. 
that they will complete it within 100 days and whatever else they said. We have a call. Oh, My apologies. Have no, no, we have a call. Holding on. Okay. Good evening. News make a line. Where, please? You have final caller. Hello? Yes, yes you have yeah, final I caller. Want, I just wanted to um, to make a comment. Where, yeah, please? I think, I think that um, what is happening there is that the, the current government is doing just like Trump. They just want to destroy everything that has been done by the Labour Party and, <clears> and, and, and create more problems than we already have. So I don't want him to go into that. All I want to say is that I just want to ask Mr. Hiller, Dr. Hiller, if you go into a private uh, area, does not that mean profit? And if you're talking about profit, that means that you have to increased costs. So going into that direction, obviously, to my mind, is going to cause an increased burden for the consumers of health care. Is that correct? Well, generally, yes. Hmm? Yeah, generally. Okay, so if we are, if you're going to go into that direction, I think that it is necessary to try and reduce on whatever cost that is going. But I do not think that that is the direction to go. What I want to suggest is that whatever the Labour Party had in place, that is what should be utilised, and get a basket of goods that you can increase upon as you go along. The other point that I wanted to ask Dr. Hiller is whether the Labour Party had thought about going regional in terms of volumes, especially when you're dealing with insurance and so on, and trying to reduce the overall cost if we include other entities within the Windward Islands so that you can reduce on your costs. We have an example, for example, in the, in the drug in the drug area where the OECS uh, comes together and they determine, you know, from uh, getting drugs from different areas and so on, <coughs> and actually reducing the cost. So what I think is that um, uh, what the Labour Party is doing, I think, is, has done is the best thing, but I just wanted to go a little further to help and reduce the cost to the, to the consumer. So what do you think of a, of, of a regional approach as an alternative to some of the some of the, the options that you have? Thank you so much for calling, sir. Right? No, I, I think I would want to add the call a lot more because of what he means by a regional approach mm -hmm. because Antigua recently opened a brand new hospital and every territory wants to have its own modern mm -hmm. hospital mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. to serve their population. So when we suggest regional, what it, but the, the, the three points, Tim. And I think Alvina raised one of them in particular. There is a management of the facility which the government has announced is going to be privatized. The government has announced that. In other words, the government is making a very bold statement that it does not have confidence in the human resource capacity of our people in St. Lucia to manage a modern hospital. That's, there is no contest about that because Alvina Reynolds just outlined the attempts that were made to put a human resource management structure in place to manage a new entity. She explained that. The government has decided to privatize that. So the government is saying, we don't have confidence in the people who run VH, and we don't have confidence in St. Lucians to be able to be recruited and to manage the new facility. Now, I have a difficulty with that. Is one, and, and I did say in my thing, the government need to say whether the, pri the private entity that's bringing in is offering technical advice or whether it is a full management and man operation and maintenance contract. Because it is one thing to provide consultancies to advise our local people how to manage the facility or whether they will be managing the facility. Because if they are managing the facility, and that's what the Prime Minister and them said, it means we don't have confidence in our local people, our technocrats, our local professionals to do it. And I think Avina Reynolds went to great lengths to explain what was being done to do so. There's a second issue, that of the financing of, uh, of the healthcare. And Avina Reynolds again pointed out that there were discussions in the Ministry of Finance, we'd come up with a number of options, the EU had provided consultants to do so. Unfortunately, it never came before the public for there to be a public dialogue on it. This government now is taking it and is about to make a decision on the financing of health care. And they have said there is not enough information put in the public yet. They have not made any decision. But they are saying 
they're going to have a universal health care insurance, which s suggests that they have made a decision where they're going. And Honorable Guy Joseph gave whether it's basket of goods, whether it's lump sum, whether it's who government will pay for, and I see contributors will now have to pay for the health insurance. There has to be the debate on the financing of health care, and that is what we're calling for, to put it fully and comprehensively before the public and there to be a national dialogue. And you had asked a question earlier, it might become politicized. Tim, everything is essentially politicized. Our country mm -hmm. has never been politicized as it is now. The, the, the victimization, the, you know, the, 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 the maliciousness has never been as prevalent as it is now. So discuss, there will be politicization of the discussion to some extent. But I still believe as a country we can have a mature dialogue as to what is the best option and the most acceptable option for us to finance healthcare. We all are committed to it. The question is, how do we do it? And the third point is the St. Jude Hospital. And of course, Honorable Guy Joseph announced that they will be building a new facility. And he said two things. It will either be next to the existing one or it will be close to the brewery. But they're hoping to use some of the existing buildings of the, the present structure. I think it's a shame and it's an insult to the people of the South. The United Workers Party said they were going to complete the project. It's two years and it's counting. And they've not done so. There's about $40 million, from what I've been informed, available to complete the project. The people of the South want the hospital. They need the hospital. And to suggest now that you're going to start all over again, Tim, I don't think it's satisfactory and it is plain unacceptable because the people of the South need proper health facilities and certainly they need to have this. And I believe the hospital should be completed and made available to the people of the South. So in all the discussion and discourse so far, there are three main issues really. The management of the, 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 the hospital, the financing of the health care, and it is very suspicious when the government says they're not pursuing universal health care. In the essence, they're not going to provide health care for everybody in the country. What they're going to provide is affordable quality health care. So they need to clarify and give us further details on that. And the St. Jude Hospital situation, as explained by Honorable Guy Joseph, is totally unacceptable. It is unfair to the people of the South. It is disrespectful to the people of the South, and we are totally opposed to it. Dr. Ernest Hiller, thank you so much for being my guest on this evening's News Make Alive. And to you, thank you so much for watching and contributing via your calls.